Our interest in this topic began with this map. It's a map of the Bay Area. It's a map of software establishments in the Bay Area in 2013. And you've heard a lot of talk about Silicon Valley in your life. And this is Silicon Valley Plus, right? Silicon Valley is essentially the San Jose area, but the software establishments all are all over the place. Now, if you look at a map like this, first thing you notice, I believe, is that the dots are visible, the places are visible, but the connections are not, and the networks are not. And these people are all there, they're all drawn into a pricey, high price um, area to locate for good reasons. And why are they paying these prices? Because nearness matters, as you can imagine. So uh, the networks, the, the dots are seen, the networks are not so easily seen, and that's the research challenge here. And here's a nice quote from these fellows, and they say, urban networks seem to provide a substitute for the benefits of agglomeration. So we're gonna talk about networks, we're gonna talk about agglomeration and the extent to which they're good substitutes. So networks and agglomeration are, of course, big in our lives, and we think it's worthwhile talking about them. So here is a network, and um, I can't vouch for the source, but supposedly they talk about how many employees from Yahoo and Lincoln and Apple and so on and so forth migrate to other firms, right? And so one good reason for the kind of apparent clustering that we see in the map is that um, people do migrate to competing and other companies, and when they migrate, or when they migrate, what do they bring with them? They bring with them information, ideas, and expertise. So the, the clustering phenomenon makes eminent sense because sharing information is an important part of the game. You may know that before Silicon Valley was so uh, pronounced, so important. People talked a lot about Route, one, Route 128 in the Boston area. And that was the rival tech cluster. And Silicon Valley surpassed um, Route 128 some years ago. And there's been some discussion, how did that happen? And one hypothesis by Annalise Saxinian, I believe, is that um, do not compete laws or do not compete agreements. Right? If I hire you and you sign a do not compete, compete agreement, then you are um, unlikely or less likely to, to take your next job at a competing firm because I can sue you, uh, at least after a two year lag or something like that. So Saxinian says that that stuff is more enforced in the Boston or in Massachusetts than it is in California. And because it's more enforced in she says, in Massachusetts and California, that clustering is less likely or less important because this stuff can't happen as much. That's an interesting observation into this research. So the basic ideas are simple. The basic ideas are that economic growth is job number one. Cities are called engines of growth. You've heard that expression before. I think what that means is cities are places where productivity and new ideas are hatched. And um, uh, Paul Romer says new recipes, new ideas, new combinations. And um, entrepreneurs have also been called engines of growth. So I guess if cities are engines of growth and if entrepreneurs are engines of growth, then it uh, suggests we should figure out what entrepreneurs in cities do. Uh, here's a long quote by Paul Romer, who is um, maybe, in my view, the top growth theorist in America, and here he's talking about these recipes, right? So um, new ideas are new recipes, new recipes are new combinations of old ideas. So it's, 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 a, it's a combinatorics problem, right? Um, when you have an aha moment one day, it's because you are reassembling old ideas you already have and you come up with a new blend or a new menu or a new idea, and that's the aha moment. So um, people that study this stuff say that there are neural networks in your brain that are busy doing this thing, 
And as you can imagine, we're going to talk about networks that are beyond your brain. So you are a walking, talking network, but you are a walking, talking network in the context of a bigger network. So you are a networked network. We all are. And you and we all are keenly interested in nurturing, looking after the networked network that we walk around with. So networking is a really interesting thing. People say it all the time. They are often loath to define what they mean by a network. It can be, can be many things, right? But anyway, in the context of the growth discussion that Paul Romer has, think about you and me and everybody in this room being working with the network, developing the network that's in our brain, and considering that that network is nourished by the network that it exists in, the context it exists in. So we are, all of us, a networked network, and we are keen to see that this network is the place where new, I where new ideas are spawned as a consequence of new combinations of old ideas that are already there. OK, now, um, there are two problems that we want to address in this research. And one problem is that uh, the existing research says that this, all this stuff I'm talking about happens in metropolitan areas. And so New York is a financial network cluster Bay Area is a tech network cluster, and so on and so forth. Um, we want to get below the metropolitan area context. It's too big. The other thing is that, as I've already mentioned, these words that we hear all so much about, agglomeration, cluster, and networking, um, are not so well defined. And we want to talk more about supply chains. So we want, to talk, we want to use the supply chain idea to replace these vague ideas that are all over, the, all over the, the literature and that are used kind of promiscuously. OK, now the fact that the, the people that talk about it's the size of the city that matters ignore urban structure. They don't want to talk about what happens below the metropolitan level analysis. And we claim that's important for, for, the, for the simple reason that you've heard expression location, location, location. If it's location, 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 how can you throw all that away and say, here's the metropolitan area, and it is big, and stuff happens, and that's all we need to know. OK, so the, the literature focuses on MSA, average population density. And that reduces this incredible complexity to one number. And how can one number explain so much? Um, you know, UZA is an urbanized area. The LA urbanized area has been the densest one in the country since the, last, since the 1980s. What does that tell us? It doesn't tell us very much, right? Um, some people are surprised that LA is the densest. And well, that's where you draw the boundaries that matters. If you draw the boundaries a lot more tightly, that would go away. So this is not a useful or a meaningful discussion. So cities, everybody agrees, are complex spatial arrangements. But many arrangements can define, can cater for the unified labor market, which is going on in this discussion. Now, we also, I said, want to introduce the idea of, of supply chains. And supply chains, I think, is not, are not discussed often enough in this literature. So we all know that prosperity, the prosperity we have, is explained by, the by gains from trade, gains from trade and specialization. And what that really means is that most people do one thing but benefit from many other things than by others. Now, if you've had a, 
a beginning econ course, you've looked at the two good, two person exchange example. And that's really um, a disaster, I think, because it skips over the, the, the meat of the problem. And the meat of the problem is that um, the emergence of complex supply chains, emergence is an important word here, is what it's really all about. So everything within reach, everything within touch, has a supply chain behind it. It's a supply chain that we don't know, we don't grasp, we don't, want, we don't have to know. Um, the stuff happens to show up on our shelves when we show, when we show up. It's there, it's at a reasonable price, it's, it's uh, usually desirable, and we have no clue how that happened. And that's the nice thing. Um, large numbers of strangers con who don't know you either contract with each other to bring you an uncountable number of things for your consumption in a very convenient way. That's why we consume so much. Okay. So supply chains are out there, but I think under-recognized or under-celebrated. Now, supply chains are nice to talk about, as I just did, I hope, but they're, they involve a lot of places that have locations. So supply chains involve a map, and supply chains involve an international map. Now, here's our old friend Jane Jacobs, who figured this out many years ago. And the way she put it was that she said, their intricate order, a manifestation of the freedom of countless numbers of people to rake, make, and carry out countless plans is in many ways a wonder. Well, she didn't use the phrase supply, the phrase supply chains, but that's what she was alluding to. This incredible complexity, which takes place under our noses, so to speak. Ronald Coase, somebody else you should know, um, talked about, you received a Nobel Prize some years ago, he asked the question, why are there firms? And why are there firms? Because somebody has to decide, what do I make, what do I buy? And how do I decide? And he said, there's a trade-off. So there's a trade-off because when you make stuff, you have monitoring costs. When you buy stuff, you have transactions costs. And everybody in the world has this choice. What do I make? What do I buy as I balance those, as I, as I trade those off? And all we're adding here to the Kosian insight is um, what to buy where? What do I make? What do I buy? And simple thought to say, what do I buy from where? So we have a bunch of a bunch of implications of the things that I've been talking about. One is that firms and people evaluate and choose places, locations, in light of their participation in many supply chains as buyers and as sellers. So that's a mouthful, right? So all of us participate in a bunch of supply chains when we buy and when we sell, particularly when we sell our labor, when we go to work. And that makes it a complex locational choice. I shop and I sell in a bunch of supply chains to make that all happen in a good way for me. Where do I, where do I set up shop? Where do I go? The, this means the superstructure of firms, locations, and networks emerges. That may be the most important sentence that I'm going to mention today. Okay? This complexity emerges in light of the supply chain information that we're all involved in. When that happens, there are a bunch of realized transactions costs, there are a bunch of realized externalities, and what I often say is when you fly over a large city, you're looking down at the ground, what do you see? And one of the answers is you're seeing a bunch of realized supply chains. That may not be apparent to you, but that's, that's our idea here. So I've already said new goods are new combinations of old goods. New ideas are new combinations of old ideas. Old ideas are from inside our heads or from the larger network of information that we have access to. 
So the combinations of possible ideas becomes huge, the bigger the network that we're operating in. And so Paul Romer again says, we consistently fail to grasp how many ideas remain to be discovered, right? It's an uncountable number. And once in a while, people will say, well, all the good ideas have already been discovered. And that's, of course, silly, right? Doesn't make any sense. So again, we each participate in many supply chains for goods and supply chains for information, stimulate, stimulation, and ideas. So supply chains for goods are well understood or well discussed, well written about. Supply chains for ideas, this is what we want to substitute or add to the agglomeration discussion, is much less discussed out there. When you read about ideas in uh, at least introductory, introductory economics, ideas are called a public good. And you know, people say ideas are in the air and they can't easily be transacted, they can't easily be expropriated, and they're just out there, and sometimes they can call a market failure, and so on and so forth. But there's really more to it than that. First of all, um, it's obvious that all of us look for useful knowledge, all right? All of us are keen to be strategic about figuring out where we go to get ideas that matter to us, that are important to us, and to our enterprise. People make it their business to locate sort and sort sources of tacit knowledge. So there is a lot of knowledge that I can send to you by email. I can send you a spreadsheet. But there's a lot of information that I cannot send you electronically because they require a conversation. So the example that's often used is, um, you know, I could send you a paragraph or a page, instructions how to ride a bicycle. You know, read this, you can ride a bicycle. It doesn't work like that. Because a lot of information involves hands-on conversation, interaction, interchange, looking at the reaction on the other person's face. Is he or she smiling? Is he or she nodding? What are they doing? And so on and so forth. That's why we have conversations. And a lot of the important stuff, a lot of the tacit knowledge cannot be transmitted electronically or formally. It involves a conversation. So immediately you have a hint that nearness, or what they used to call death of distance, death of distance is, um, is not possible because there are so many things that we require a conversation for, to be in the same room for, because nuances and reactions and all those things matter. And then, of course, people pay, sometimes heavily, for sites and places where there is inf inf uh, an information exchange advantage. So I think those three simple ideas undermine this dismissal that ideas are a public good and we can't do much about them. So OK, so here's, con um, here's tacit information. Here is riding a bicycle. And Joel Mokir writes about this stuff a lot. So the information story is is pretty complicated. And when people talked about death of distance, there was actually a book called Death of Distance written about 20 plus years ago, um, they weren't thinking of this problem, that we can conquer distance electronically. We can conquer distance electronically for some information, but not for all information. And that's why people continue to pay high prices, high rents, to be in proximity to each other, because they understand it's not all about electronics. So supply chains for goods are easily described. We have economists have production functions that describe the, tr the statistical relationship between inputs and outputs. And uh, so economists work with input-output tables that publish these relationships. But the supply chains for ideas are more complicated, more difficult to discover. And our question is, what can we observe about all these things when we look at the available data? Now, to review, firms buy and sell goods. They create and seek information and ideas. And we call that networking. People do the same thing. They buy and sell goods. 
They create, seek information, ideas, and stimuli. So again, that's networking all over again. So this is from Neil Ferguson's, Neil Fergan, Ferguson's book, The Tower, The Square and the Tower. He talks about networks. And what he's trying to tell you is here is, my God, okay, here is James Watt, the guy who invented the um, steam engine some time ago. And here are the people he spoke to or worked with when he came up with the steam engine idea. Ferguson calls it a network. I think it's more appropriately called a supply chain for ideas. Because James Watt was strategic uh, where to look for ideas that would stimulate the things that interested him in his work. Okay, I mentioned all these things already. Our brains are network networks work to expand networks beyond our heads. And in the paper, which I can make available to you, you can see there are all kinds of smart people out there, names that you recognize, who say similar things or plausible things that I, we think are in line with our, with our hypothesis. So I'll skip those right now. Okay, so you can look all that stuff up. And I'll pass over that. OK, so um, what I've been talking about, some people call co-location. And the co-location evidence is um, mostly um, discovered or talked about in the, in the commuting field, because we have a lot of data on journey to work. And when we look at data like these, we look at how um, journey to work average distances do not vary so much whether you're either in the US or Los Angeles or where in those places, then how can that be? You get that kind of regularity because everybody is strategic about where they co-locate because not being strategic would be crazy. In fact, Alex Anas, somebody who you might know of, he's boil this down into a very simple statement. He said, the data of the largest US metropolitan areas show that commute times increase only slightly with city size. The elasticity of the average commute time with respect to the number of workers was 0 0.1 in 1990 and 2000. Okay, so as the number of workers in the city doubles, the commute distance increases by 10%. Now, how can that be? How can that be? That can only be because people are strategic, both the employers and the employees, about where to locate, because it would be crazy not to be strategic. To find uh, firm and employee employment location pattern, uh, we used two data sets. One is InfoUSA data. The other one is US implant input output data. So InfoUSA provides uh, firm location um, with number of employees in each firm by industry sector. And we aggregated the data by 84 industry sectors and by census block group to make uh, the variable we need. And U.S. implant uh, input output data provides uh, dollar flow between industry sectors. And this data was used to calculate input-output technical coefficient, which shows interdependence between industry sectors in terms of sales and purchases. And uh, we um, also focused on tech and venture capital sectors, because uh, capital without ideas or ideas without capital by themselves uh, may be meaningless, so we expect networking is required. So this is the question, uh, research question we had. So pairwise co-location can be measured by applying implant, uh, um, the InfoUSA data. Can we explain it? And are co-location choices a function of choices 
a fun function of shipping cost. Shipping cost um, can be calculated from implant uh, improper data. Then how much? What can we say about core location besides technical linkages, which means uh, shipping cost? So this table uh, shows the result of linear regression model. Dependent variable is core location coefficient calculated by um, InfoUSA data. And independent variables are technical coefficients which represent shipping cost. So we see that two variables are statistically significant. And the R square is a little bit over 3%. So we can say that uh, shipping cost may explain about 3% of co-location of industry sectors. So we looked at um, the location of each firms uh, in Southern California, similar to uh, the, the um, San Francisco area. So this map shows uh, tech firms. And this map shows venture capital firms. And we combined uh, the two sectors. So we see that uh, there are some clustering and the firms are spread all over uh, Southern California. So uh, to see if agglomeration or clustering uh, exists or how much clustering is in Southern California, we applied replace k function. This function um, measure the degree of clustering compared to the random distribution. This uh, chart is one example uh, showing beverage and tobacco products in Southern California. Um, the horizontal axis shows distance by meter, and vertical axis shows the replace replace k function. And there are four lines in the graph. The middle red line represents uh, random distribution. If the forms are distributed randomly, it should exactly follow this line. And the top line, which is uh, similar to green, it shows um, observed pattern of these forms. And there are two lines between random distribution, which shows confidence interval. So if the observed pattern falls into these two lines, we can say that uh, these, these forms are randomly distributed. Can I ask something? Yep. Okay. Just, it took me a while to, to understand this, but what the software does is as you, ex as you increase the concentric rings, around these firms uh, with these distances in meters, what are the odds that you encounter another firm in the same sector? In this case, the food and beverage sector. Okay? And I think what John is saying is in this case, as you expand the rings around each firm, the odds of encountering another firm of the same industry do not depart from a random encounter. So if it's a random encounter, then it may not be something we call purposeful agglomeration. Is that a fair way to say it? Yeah, thank you. So we see that uh, the observed pattern is a little bit above the high confidence level. And when the distance increases, it falls into the range. So this industry shows a little bit of agglomeration or clustering. <coughs> How about the two sectors we uh, focused on? Tech sector shows a way of uh, random distribution. And we often say that uh, large firms may not need uh, clustering because they can exist by themselves. So we uh, separated large firms for tech firm, large 
um, firms in tech sector. And it shows uh, less clustering than the old firms. How about uh, venture capital? It shows similar pattern and we separated large firms for venture uh, capital industry and it shows a little bit less clustering pattern. And we combine the two, it shows a little bit uh, more um, clustering pattern than the individual sectors. And the large forms of the combined uh, the, the, the sectors uh, shows a little bit um, less agglomeration or clustering pattern. So, what does it all mean? Oh, you want me to say? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what does it all mean? Okay. When when you looked at the when you looked at the graphics, um, notice that okay, how would you how big would you say a big downtown is? A big downtown is on a side five kilometers. A big downtown. Okay, yeah, exactly. Um, so when people talk about major downtowns, they talk about. 5,000 meters or five kilometers, all right? The clustering that we observe in these diagrams go way beyond that. So in other words, in these, in these diagrams, 5,000 meters is nothing. So it is, as the map suggests, it is clustering near and far. Remember, the gap between the the 45 degree line and the observed line is the odds of encountering another firm as distance increases. So the clustering uh, phenomenon, the clustering phenomenon near and far, this is pretty far out here, seems to be observed pretty strongly. Yes. Is the distance from what? Oh. You're looking at each firm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are expanding concentric rings about each and every firm. Okay, so that graph distance. is the, the end of the graph is the number of firms. The curve is based on the number of firms. <coughs> Well, the, this is for all the firms. Okay, right. so you're yeah, right, exactly. So you're looking at, you are, again, you're expanding concentric rings about all the firms in this sector, in this place. And you're saying as the rings get bigger, what are the odds of encountering another firm? And the gap here tells you it's bigger than random. So there is, there is purposeful co-location. Okay, so anyway, um, the findings then to, to summarize. Um, ah, I right, both the San Francisco and the LA maps and the data show that there is interfirm, there are interfirm linkages near and far. Uh, transactions cost, as we saw in the regression, explained very little of this, about 3% or economizing on transactions costs explains only about 3%. Um, but agglomeration is evident, meaning that non-transaction links are important. The curves you just saw, the Ripley K estimates, suggest again, agglomeration is evident near and far, much beyond five kilometers. Um, so, Geography and space still matter, surprise, surprise, uh, even in this age of, of electronic communications. There is no death of distance. And sector firm and size make a little difference to this story, make not a lot of difference to this story. So learning is hard, as you know. The diffusion of ideas is important. The diffusion ideas is what spreads productivity gains or productivity opportunities. And you may have heard of something called the productivity puzzle. 
The productivity puzzle, if you've not heard of it, says simply that productivity statistics that we, that we get from government agencies suggest that productivity growth has slowed down. Nevertheless, we all know that wonderful tech gadgets are everywhere in business and personal use and so on and so forth. So the riddle is, how can the data show productivity slow down when we have all this cool stuff, both at home and at work, uh, available to us? And one answer is that, or one suggested answer, is that learning is slow or adaptation is slow. And people point to the fact that um, electricity uh, uh, became, widespread, ava became available in a widespread way in America about 100 years ago, but its adoption into factory life uh, took a long time. So it's the learning is hard story. And um, so the, the productivity puzzle, so-called, may be explained by the, the difficulty or the, the, the hard work it takes to spread information and to spread ideas. Okay, so um, we're not gonna stop, and <laughs> we think, <laughs> all right. Uh, we're gonna look at more sectors, we're gonna look at more disaggregation, we're gonna look at more metropolitan areas, we're gonna compare metropolitan areas, we're gonna compare years, so the possibilities are endless. So if, if you'll have us back, we'll be back, if you'll have us back, right? And, um, if you have questions, you're welcome to just ask them now or send, ask them by email. So that should be it. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about supply chains for goods and uh, information. So I think maybe, as I understand, maybe supply chain for goods is like the example of um, beverage is kind of a supply chain for goods, if I can. But I, actually, uh, if we understand that um, the interactions between tax firms increase because they locate near each other to enjoy the supply, supply chain for information. But I don't know if um, <coughs> beverage firms are also interacting, interacting with each other for that reason, for transforming goods. Maybe if you, um, I don't know if you can, you can try link um, freight companies to manufacturing. I don't know if it's, it's possible to link two industries to show that linkages. Sure. Um, well, like I said, in the combined graphic, we link, we link two of them. We linked uh, tech and venture capital. Um, but I think you're asking a good question, and that is that um, Information exchange is key in the obvious sectors, the tech sectors, but information exchange is also important in manufacturing sectors. And John showed you that one beverage and whatever it was, okay. That is, um, I think that was an extreme case where the, the, the observed interactions are very close to the 45 degree line. In most cases, they depart. So in other words, the, the spatial encounters um, that are not random, not randomly explained, are pretty profound in most of these sectors. But you're asking a good question because the question is, see, we assume that ideas are more important in some sectors than others. My guess right now, information exchange is important in most sectors. But that's, yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, further um, ask more questions uh, for the uh, Jack's point. But um, maybe the, for instance, the retail firms, um, their primary uh, factor for location might be uh, consumers. So if we counter for the location of consumers, uh, their population, maybe the effect of the um, clustering may go away. Or uh, for the manufacturing firms, um, maybe zoning or, or land use be critical for them, or maybe access to uh, highways or um, freight nodes, uh, airports, or airports might be more important than uh, inter-farm interactions. 
and collocation. Do you have any? Right. The, the, those are certainly worth investigating. You're right. Okay. Um, you can you can get the consumers and you can get the labor force pretty much all over the metropolitan area because the connectivity is pretty good. <coughs> but you're right. Um, a more substantial analysis would add some control control variables. You're right. Did you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, th that's a good point. Um, we have parcel data and also um, uh, the transportation network. So we, uh, one time we uh, compared the location and looked at the many firms are located along the freeway. Right. So uh, we, th that's a good point. We are looking into it. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the supply chain inference for information as well. I've never heard it that way, so that was very enlightening, and uh, I, I like that very much. But my, my question has to go with, I mean, as far as the, the study that you've done so far is California, Los Angeles, San Francisco based, um, and in the highly developed place with technology and all of that. I would be very interested to see in like emerging technology areas as well that are starting out or maybe that are, aren't as mature as there, how, how that works as well. So hopefully, I would, I would love it if the next generation would include some of those places and maybe even you know, going all the way to the other side from a developing country perspective now if data is, is available, of course, you know, to, to have that range to see if you still see the similar types of trends would be very interesting. Well, well sure. sure. I mean, data permitting, the more comparisons, the better. And I think you're right. There are some interesting hypotheses lurking about old areas, newer areas. And, you know, Saxinian has her story about Boston versus Silicon Valley. But you're right. Those are wonderful. Wonderful questions. Thank you.